Hello, everyone. How are you doing? Excellent. This is a season of transitions. And maybe there's a few of you out there whose lives don't really have much of a change from the summer to the fall schedule. But I know there's a bunch of you that have a very different schedule that you are getting used to. If you are in school or if you work at a school or if you work somewhere that revolves around a school schedule or if you have grandkids in school, your lives may be looking very different in this season and you are just trying to get into this whole new routine. For me personally, my life has stayed the same. I just keep chugging along full time at church. There's always something to do, it's awesome. We're transitioning into fall schedule. But the rest of my family's life has been changing and I've had to adapt to that. My son started in elementary school again and his activities. My husband started teaching at MSUM. My, and now we have an exchange student who's in high school and high school sports. You guys, that's a big commitment. Do you realize that? All of a sudden, I feel like a grown-up parent. Like I've entered this advanced stage of parenting where my husband and I actually have to communicate and we have to figure out who's getting who and who's bringing who where and when and make sure we're all in the right places. And we're killing it. We are. <laughs> Two weeks in. Okay. But transition is hard. So I'm sitting here thinking, all of you must also be going through a lot of changes too. Which brings me to my next question. What are you all doing here? Life is busy. Why are you here? Why have you carved out this space of time to be here in this place? Well, my hope is that you are here to get in touch with your heartbeat and with the heartbeat of God, and that by doing that, you are able to experience some of the joy that God wants to give you and wants to have us share in collectively. And I invite you to come to this place regularly. Yes, I know God is everywhere. God is out there in the craziness of our lives, but it's a beautiful thing to come and press pause and be in the presence of God together. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. I find that when I stay away from worship and making that time to focus on the presence of God, God becomes smaller. I'm able to fit God into a stereotype of what God might be or a caricature of what God could be. I'm able to fit God into such a small box that all of a sudden God agrees with all my politics and all my worldviews and all my prejudices and God doesn't challenge me at all. But when we stop, when we press pause and we focus on the presence of God and let God be God, God becomes this expansive being that we can't even fathom. And at the same time, God is real in the person of Jesus. And we get to encounter that God together. And that God is big. And that God, when we come into the presence of that God, that God makes us question all of our assumptions of who's in and who's out and who's right and who's wrong. And we get convicted when we are in the presence of this God. And at the same time, we get comforted. That's what happens in these parables that Jesus shares with people today. So let's dig into God's word and see how God is confronting us today. Jesus shared two parables, which are simple stories that show us a window into who God is, and also it highlights things about us and our human nature. And Jesus shares these two parables with two groups of people. And they're introduced at the beginning of this Bible passage as the tax collectors and sinners, which you know they're the bad people just by those labels, taxes and sinning. Those, those are the bad people. And so I have a helpful diagram to keep it straight. And then we have this other group called the Pharisees and the scribes. And these are religious leaders. These guys, they know how to follow the rules and they love following rules and they're good at following rules and they uphold the religious traditions. And 
the good guys are feeling upset. They're grumbling because they see Jesus breaking two very important religious rules. They see Jesus breaking the rules of welcoming and eating with bad people. And they get upset. So Jesus has all these people, the good people and the bad, in front of him. And he says, let me tell you a story. So there's this shepherd who has a hundred sheep, and he loses one of them. So he goes and he searches for that sheep. And when he finds that one sheep, he is so filled with joy that he puts that sheep on his shoulders and brings it home and calls all of his friends and neighbors together and throws the biggest party, and it's awesome. And the way Jesus tells this story to this group is he poses it as a question, as a rhetorical question. And when you ask a rhetorical question, you ask it in a way that you're expecting people to agree with you. He says, so if you were to lose this sheep, you would go look for it, right? And you'd leave behind the 99, and then you'd throw a huge ridiculous party because you were so happy to get your sheep. And you'd do that, right? And they say, yeah, sure, that's super compassionate, yeah. And then they think about it for a moment longer, and then they shake their head and they're like, no, wait, Jesus, that's a terrible strategy. If you leave the 99 sheep, what's going to happen to them? If you go after that one stinking sheep that wandered too far away, bears or wolves could come and attack the rest of the flock, or more of them could just wander off. Jesus, you would be a terrible shepherd. Don't ever employ that strategy. That is bad news. So then Jesus says, okay, I got another story for you. Jesus says, suppose you're a woman who has 10 coins, and you lose one of them. You'd tip your house upside down looking for it, and when you found it, you would invite the whole neighborhood and all of your friends, and you would throw the biggest party, and you would celebrate that you found your last coin. And he asked it as a question. You'd do that, right? And they say, sure. And then they'd think about it, and they'd stop, and they'd shake their heads, and they'd say, no, uh, Jesus, that actually doesn't make sense. Because this woman... Yeah, it's fine that she looked for her lost coin and she found it. We're really happy about that. But why would she then throw a party and spend more money than that coin was even worth? Probably more money than all 10 coins are worth. That doesn't make economic sense. Just find your coin and put it back in your coin purse and be happy that you have it. Here's the thing. God's priorities are different than ours. God thinks differently than we do. God cares about different things than we care about. And we come face to face with that when we engage Jesus' words that he shares with us. Here is how God and us are different. Us. We are busy with life. There is a lot going on. We got a lot of activities, a lot of places to be, a lot of things to do. We are busy, and so we have to be practical. And we have to be efficient. And if we lose one sheep, you know, it's, you know, sad, but whatevs. We got 99 sheep we got to care for. So we have to be practical. We have to be efficient. We cut our losses. We have a can-do attitude. I'm good at caring for the sheep that I still have. And I'm independent. I don't need anybody. I got this. I'm good. God is different. God is also busy, just like we are. But God is busy searching for those who have wandered away, searching for the lost, searching for people who are desperate to be found and can't find their way back. God is busy out there, always wanting to bring people back to God and bring people back to each other. God is busy doing this all the time. And God is super impractical because God is always wanting to interrupt our busy lives with ridiculous parties to just celebrate that we all have this relationship with God and that we all have a God that we can count on who never will abandon us. So God just wants to keep interrupting our lives with parties, and that doesn't make sense to us. So we can respond to these parables, to these stories, in a few different ways. If we are people who think we're in the bad crowd, the crowd that's the out crowd, We might think, you know, I just, I know I don't have it together, and I just gotta, I just gotta work a little harder. I just gotta be a little bit better. I gotta get stuff straightened out. I gotta get on the straight and narrow, and then I'm gonna be acceptable to God, 
and I'm going to be acceptable to other people, and I just got to try harder, and I can do this. And we beat ourselves up. And if you think you are one of the good people in the good crowd, and you're good at following rules, and you've got life pretty much figured out, and you're killing it at dropping off and picking up your kids when they need to be picked up and dropped off, you might be thinking, you know what, I work really hard to do this, and I don't like that God is just going to be as kind and welcoming to the people who don't have it together as to me. That makes me angry that God's going to be showing as much care for people who don't deserve it as God shows to me. But I am going to propose a different reaction, one that's different than beating ourselves up to try harder or feeling like everybody else is worse than us and we should be getting more praise. I'm going to say, let's all be here in this place and let's rejoice. Let's be thankful that we have a God who has different priorities than we do. Let's be thankful that we have a God that operates differently than we do. If you look at these parables and you ask yourselves, now what character would we be? We would be the lost sheep and the lost coin. Who would God be? God would be that terrible shepherd and that scatterbrained woman. And what did the sheep do to get itself found? Nothing. It just wandered away. God was the one who said, I'm going to put all the onus of responsibility on me and I'm going to seek out that sheep. I'm going to find it and bring it home. What did the coin do to save itself, to find itself in this parable? Nothing. It just laid there being lost. And God, playing the part of the scatterbrained woman, comes and finds it and rejoices. That's something we can all be thankful for. I think every time we gather together, we act out these parables. Because we're a group of people that is mixed with good and bad. I'm not going to have you self-identify. I'm not going to call anybody out. But I know there's bad and good here. Because I know that there's bad and good in each of our hearts. And every single week, God calls this whole group together. And we have this party. It's kind of lame compared to the ridiculously awesome parties that God throws up in heaven. But we have this party, you all were at it already, where we give out some bread, we give out some wine or some grape juice. And for people who don't receive communion yet, we give them a blessing and we say, Jesus loves you. And every single people, every single person hears these words, the body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. Every single person, the good and the bad, gets a piece of Jesus. Gets Jesus coming out to them and saying, I have found you. I'm glad you're here. Let's party. Now, last week in our bulletin, somebody pointed out something to me and they had a question about it. Their question was about communion. This was in our Sanctuary Events Center worship service that was at 10 o'clock. And the song that was sung during communion was No Outsiders. But the person who asked this question was from the traditional service last week, and they didn't know that this was a song. And they said, no outsiders are welcome at communion at Sanctuary? Really? And I said, no, I need to correct this. The song is called No Outsiders, and the whole phrase goes, there are no outsiders to your love. We are all welcome. There's grace enough. That's the message I want you all to know. And I don't want anybody to be beating themselves up trying to be better or looking around and thinking they're better than somebody else. I want all of us to be in that same boat of saying, you know what? We're all welcome at this party. And God wants to keep interrupting our busy lives with a ridiculous celebration that we have God and we have each other. And that's amazing. So I'm glad that you're here. Amen.